Welcome to worship at United Presbyterian Church. Pastor Michelle is away today, but we have Bob Gerard filling the pulpit for us. So please join me in the call to worship. God speaks peace to the faithful, to those who turn to God in their hearts. Surely salvation is at hand for those who fear God. Where God dwells, steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground, and righteousness looks down from the sky. God gives what is good, and we respond with abundant praise. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come. Longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your
psalmist tells us that when we turn to God in our hearts, God speaks peace to the faithful. As we turn to God in true confession of our sin, we trust in God who shalom makes us whole. Please join with me in the prayer of confession. Gracious God, you call us to step out in faith, trusting in you for all things. We respond to your command, but then sink in doubt and fear. We hide from the challenges of bold discipleship. We are not able to fulfill your commandments for our purposes are never in full accord with yours. Forgive us, we pray, when we confess with our lips but do not believe in our hearts. Help us to practice our faith in all circumstances. Lift us out of sin into the arms of your mercy. Though we are distracted by noise all around, allow us to hear your voice, even when it is the sound of sheer silence. Jesus is Lord. God raised him from the dead, and we are saved through him. This is the good news. We believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. This is good news to share with all people. friends. I'm coming to you from the kitchen today. It's a lot easier to tell a story with water in the kitchen using the sink than trying to lug a lot of water into the sanctuary. So as you can see, I have a sink full of water and some things. We're going to see what sinks and what floats. So first off, I have a wooden block. What do you think? Think it'll sink? Oh no, I was wrong. It's floating. What about a spoon? Oh, that sinks right down. Next, I have some aluminum foil. Oh, that floats also. Now I have some more foil, the same size, but it's wrapped up in a ball. Let's see what happens. Oh, it floats as well. So, are you a sinker or a floater? Don't worry, I won't throw you in the water the next time I see you, but I bet we can find the answer in the Bible. Do you remember the story where Jesus fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish? Well, after that happened, he told his disciples to take their boat and go fishing. And he was going to go up into the mountains to be alone and pray. So after a while, while the disciples were out on their boat, the wind came up and the water got very, very rough. And the disciples were worried that they would sink. As they were worrying, they realized they saw Jesus walking towards them on the water. And... Peter said, Jesus, if that is really you, please let me walk on water to meet you. And Jesus said, come. So Peter stepped out of the boat and he only took a couple of steps before he realized what he was doing and how scared he was. And then he began to sink. He said, Lord, please save me. And Jesus said, oh, you have little faith. Why do you doubt? As long as Peter kept his eyes on Jesus and had his faith in Jesus, he was fine walking on the water. But when he started to think about all the things around him and how scary it could be, that's when he started to sink. You know, we all have troubles in our lives. We all have storms we have to face. No matter how rough or how scary they are, just remember that Jesus is there for us. He's there for me, he's there for you, and he will hold us up and care for us. Let's say a prayer. Lord, thank you for always being there with us, always holding us and caring for us and loving us. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The scripture lesson for today is from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Just before this passage, Jesus had just fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side 
while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat battered by the waves was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. It's an honor to be with you today. Many thanks to Michelle for the opportunity. Right after I retired from serving churches on May 31st, 2014, my wife Holly took me to Jordan in Israel with a tour group. As a part of the tour, we visited the Sea of Galilee and the town of, towns of Capernaum and Bethsaida on the North Shore, where today's scripture passage takes place. Capernaum was where Jesus had a house. Seeing this area gave me a new perspective on where and how Jesus carried out a lot of his ministry. Allow me to further describe where and how Jesus did all of this. The Sea of Galilee is actually a lake fed by the Jordan River, which flows into it from the north. It's about the size and square miles of the Flaming Gorge Reservoir in Wyoming. The sea is 13.5 miles long and 8 miles wide. It is the lowest in elevation freshwater lake in the world and 700 feet below sea level. On the west side of the lake is a medium rolling hill which gradually rises up from the shore. On the east side, a 2,000 foot hill or mountain rises almost straight up just a couple miles from the shore. In modern times, this eastern area is called the much fought over area, Golan Heights. And from the Golan Heights, we can see the whole Sea of Galilee and all the towns that are around it. With this kind of valley the sea sits in, wind is often a factor, as it is in Wyoming. It can be a very calm, still scene for one minute, and the next a 40 to 50 mile an hour wind can whip through there. Sounds familiar, yes? In Matthew 14, we learn that it has been a long day for Jesus in that valley. Late in the morning or very early in the afternoon, he had been told that his cousin John the Baptist had been beheaded by Herod Antipas through the vengeful request of his stepdaughter Salome and her mother Herodias. Now grieving, Jesus left his home in Capernaum on the north by northwest shore of the sea to head to the mountain several miles to his east to pray to God and be alone in his grief. But the crowds of people who followed him needed his, needed his attention. So most likely near Bethsaida, about four miles away on the north by northeast shore, further down, he delayed his own grief and with great compassion taught and healed the people. He spent the whole afternoon ministering, loving his neighbors, until supper time or near 6 p.m. When supper time arrived, he also miraculously fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. This gracious man had to be exhausted and hurting from the strain of grief not yet processed. Finally, the people ate and went home. Jesus then sent his disciples home to Capernaum, 
by fishing boat across the sea. And he began his reef walk going east up the 2,000 foot mountain to pray to God and be nurtured himself. The disciples, now on their own for the first time after having taken out following Jesus, arrived at the middle of the sea, at least four miles from any shore. Gale force winds suddenly swooped in through the Jordan Valley and fierce gusts struck the waters and shot a fishing boat now weighed down with the 12 shocked and fearful disciples. Perhaps the boat was being swamped by the waves. It had to be what we experience in Wyoming as we drive past one of the cliffs or mountain passes on I-25, I-80 or 287, where the 18-wheeler tipping winds jump all over us like a ferocious beast. Not only were the disciples afraid of the wind, but even more so of the sea. The sea itself, in biblical thought, connotes the forces of chaos, dark powers, and death held at bay by the creative act of God, but still always life-threatening. The sea here is a barrier that separates the disciples from Jesus, who represents the presence of God. In the midst of the chaos of that world, we are left alone in the boat, with only fragile crafts around us, preserving us from its threat. That's what the disciples were, and guess what? We are too in many ways. As they were buffeted by the stormy winds of conflict and persecution, mentioned three times in this passage, <laughs> they were crying out for help. See, the disciples in the boat were being badly rocked, just as we are in our boats today. Before the life-threatening pandemic winds blew into us like a Category 5 hurricane, we had our political chaos, racial tensions, healthcare confusion on top of whatever personal problems shook our stability. Now, on top of all this, we suffered the waves of job loss, COVID-19 caused illnesses and death, an overwhelmed healthcare system, confusion about opening schools, universities, and businesses, plowing into our boat and threatening to sink us. With the first disciples, we may be screaming at the top of our lungs, where is Jesus when we need him? Well, we need him all the time, but we really, really, really need him now. The disciples struggled to keep afloat in that windstorm for maybe six to eight hours before Jesus arrived. It appears that the wind and the waves kept them from sailing to any shore. The text informs us that it was not until the early morning hours, between 3 and 6 a.m., while it is still dark, that Jesus makes his appearance. In the midst of this crisis, when their energy reserves are spent, Jesus reveals himself to them. In this exhausted state, with the roar of the waves and the spray of the sea drenching their boat, they mistake the Lord of creation for a phantom. And some biblical scholars think that this story was a post-resurrection event where Jesus changed body, allowed for walking on water and looking like a ghost. Anyway, Given the common perception of the sea as the center of evil and chaos, it's hard to blame them for initially mistaking the figure of Jesus walking on the water for a specter of death. After all, it is they who have rode into the middle of evil's realm, and the waves indeed are attacking them. Over their cries of fear, Jesus calls to them, Literally translated, take heart, I am, do not be afraid. This self-revelation of I am is a disclosure of Jesus' source of power, God. Jesus revealed himself just as God revealed himself to Moses. Jesus was saying, I am being in life itself, take heart. Now, God bless Peter, the impetuous one. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. 
Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. Yet when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and, be and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Well, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God, a son that can control strong winds and evil seas. Who among us would fault Peter for his momentary doubt? Just like Peter, we know we are to keep our eyes on Jesus. But in the middle of life-threatening experiences, our fears and faith get all jumbled together. In 2020, are we any different than Peter? In 2020, like Peter, we need to continually refocus our eyes on Jesus. Yet, how are we to do this when he is no longer physically with us? I will lift up two of endless number of possibilities. We can see Jesus walking toward us in the actions of other people who trust in him. And I may be preaching to the choir and saying all that I have said to you today. For you are a church that has kept its eyes on Jesus. In my 20 years in this presbytery, twice I saw how Jesus is with this church as you went through a couple of storms that could have sunk your boat. I saw elders and members here who by faith and the study of scriptures kept their eyes on Jesus to remind you all in word and deed that Jesus Christ is the head of the church and not any particular individual. You know that you are the body of Christ who has been given the living Lord's mission to share the good news in this community and the world, and you do it. And as the hymn expresses, you know that Jesus calls you o'er the tumult of our life's wild restless seas. Day by day, his voice still calls us, saying, Christian, follow me. And you have. You've been blessed with a new pastor who understands and practices this too. You have been this kind of example to me of ultimately keeping your eyes on Jesus. We must also continue to look for him walking towards us to lift us up and keep us going as we find in the scriptures. If we will but use our eyes to read the scriptures and take them to heart and practice them. In the scriptures, Jesus promises to be with us always in the Spirit until the end of the age. He asks us to trust Him by faith, a gift He gives us through the Spirit. In them, He tells us and teaches us to see Him as we pray to Him in an unceasing manner. In them, He tells and shows us how much He loves us and to what lengths He will go in His love to guide and redeem us. One of my favorite biblical passages was not said by Jesus, but he knew it and was an example of it. It is what God told the Jews in 586 BC. They had had their country and temple destroyed and were dragged off to Babylon. For me today, it describes how God is walking with us and leading us through all the circumstances of life. It encourages me to keep looking for God and Jesus Christ walking towards me in times of grief, illness, and troubles of all kinds. It is from Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 5. But now thus says the Lord, who created you and who formed you, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Because you are precious in my sight, and honored, and I love you, do not fear. 
for I am with you. In these days of troubled seas, keep your eyes on Jesus by the redeeming power of God's grace and love. And for our good, he keeps his eyes on us. Generous God, we thank you for your call and claim upon our lives, because there is so much more we can become and so much more we can do. We pray that our faith will increase, that our practice of generosity will be enlarged, and that our joy in believing will encourage others as we share with them the good news of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Let us pray. O God of creation in our lives, we offer a prayer of thanksgiving for the presence you are, you are in every aspect of our lives. When turbulent waves almost engulfed Christ's disciples, you sent your son Jesus to calm their fear. He walked on the waters of hell by your hands and tempered their fright, sustained by your mercy. We recall how Peter would walk out to greet him. He would show boldness in the midst of the tempest, only to lose heart when the seas became rough. We give you thanks for this abiding witness, which testifies to your trust in your people in spite of their doubt. We owe our very existence to your pardon, which lets us well in your favor. We acknowledge your safekeeping that is the bedrock of faith. There are times when Christ calls us to take perilous journeys, to venture amid uncharted terrain in response to your will. We pray for your presence, that it will sustain us, and for your guidance, that we may not lose heart. Our communities like Larry and the greater world, such as Lebanon and Syria, teem with people whose lives are filled with fear because of a pandemic and its resultant side effects. We thank you for your strengthening presence experienced so often in the scientists, nurses, doctors, EMTs, and paramedics who have said to be healers, and the government leaders who work so hard to provide health care and, ec and economic solutions, and then the volunteers who feed the hungry. O Lord, where there is lack of such leadership, may your wisdom and compassion stimulate urgent corrective thinking and action. We thank you for your healing power that has restored millions to health and continues to support those in recovery. We thank you for the hope of the resurrection in your comforting arms as they surround those who have tragically lost loved ones. In the midst of this scary storm, help us to work for measures of racial and economic reform that will bring fairness, equality, and even justice to our society. Thank you for the constant outpouring of your unconditional love and grace into our lives to give us blessed assurance that your outreaching hands are always there with the grip of security to rescue us from the wild and restless seas of life. Help us to remember this as we pray together the prayer that calls for your kingdom to come into this world. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
May the peace and presence of God, which passes all understanding, keep your very being secure in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.